If I have accomplished considerable, and there are lots of fruits to be shown from my artist in residentship in these 37 intervening years, that it is very largely due to the mood of existence that I have been able to carry on here. Gunnar Johansson is the first musician to be established as an artist in residence at any university in the nation. Acclaimed as a concert pianist, Professor Johansson embodies the Renaissance ideals. He is an educator, a naturalist, an observer of the sciences. He is vitally concerned with the burdens of society and its environment, with the educational system, with developing a new steam engine, a hydrogen-powered aircraft, and an academy named for the great Leonardo da Vinci. For over 35 years, he has chosen Blue Mounds as his home and the University of Wisconsin as his theater of operations, where he is the artist in residence. Johansson came to the United States, San Francisco, where he served as a recitalist for NBC. In 1938, he embarked on a tour playing 12 historical concerts in each of several American and international capitals, spanning the repertoire from Frescobaldi to Stravinsky. It was during his stopover in Chicago that Professor Johansson met Carl Bricken, about to become head of the music department at the University of Wisconsin. Professor Johansson was invited to come along, and upon learning that the Pro Arta Quartet would also be in residence, accepted the invitation. So with the options open for freedom to concertize, Gunnar Johansson became an artist in residence. The artist in residence concept was really pioneered at Wisconsin, wasn't it? It was, indeed. Uh, I remember being an early subscriber to the Life magazine, and in 1937, it featured an article on the regionalists. And these regionalists were three artists, each representing a state, university and a state. John Stuart Curry at Wisconsin, a Grant Wood at Iowa, and Thomas Benton in Kansas. Mm -hmm. That was 1937, 39 is when I joined the university. Since coming to Madison, I know you, you have concertized a lot, but that full-blown concert career didn't really materialize, did it? Uh, no, it never fell to my lot to uh, exchange my mood of life for so many months of the year by living in a suitcase. And that suited me utterly well. When I first came to America, I was fortunate in having a kind of employment by NBC that was called a sustaining program where I played a piano recital of half hour duration every Sunday night. That went for five years. And uh, that of course meant that I didn't have to travel. All the travel I did was to follow my instinct in the way of desire for um, chasing landscapes. Well, looking around this beautiful pastoral setting, I can see why hotels and contracts were not as attractive as, as the beautiful nature you can live with every day. Yes, indeed, it has been a real privilege to be able to live 12 months of the year in the country. I have always been given to wandering in nature. First, when I gained the ability to bicycle. I was forever going outside of the city of Copenhagen to see the country. And then I gained the much greater ease of a motorcycle in getting about. I extended my excursions all the way down to Italy. I understand you found this house in Blue Mounds just after World War II. And one day in April, we came down the hill that you just came, came down. And we looked over here and we said, oh, what an interesting setting this is. And of course, there was no doubt about it that 
This was just what we had been looking for, namely a stone house and sitting in the woods. So we moved in carrying all 2,000 books that I had on our backs up in here and finally the farmers helped us to make a road and we moved the rest of our goods in. And as we were walking around, they looked down, there was a little squirrel right on my foot. I said, this is a wonderful omen. Right on my foot, not near the foot, but on the foot. We quarried much of the stone that went into the making the first edition as well as particularly the second edition, which is my studio down below here. Mm -hmm. So those hands don't just play the piano, they chop wood and they quarry stone and... They quarry stone and I chainsaw, that's what really my, my present passion. <laughs> it's the chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've seen uh, several stacks of wood out around your, your house. Uh, I, I hope you have because they're downright mountainous at this point. <laughs> Well, I know that you're also reaching a very large number of students on the university campus in your music and performance class, which has how many students? I think it's upward of 750 now. That has to be one of the largest classes on the campus, and that's a, a different 750 students each semester, basically. Yes. So, uh, literally, uh, hundreds and thousands of students have been able to uh, partake of that, your that's class. That's right. I know he wrote in 59, the year of Tristan, this first prelude called Weinklagen, which is only about five, six pages long, and then developed it later, three years later, into this large piece, uh, which exists as an organ piece as well as a piano piece, Weinklagen Variations. <laughs> I have contact with a great many young people who may be, for the first time, initiated into classical music. And this I am overwhelmingly aware of, of course, the responsibility of this. And increasingly, over the years, I am aware of the role that an artist, and particularly a musician, can play in sensitizing the growing generation to life from other periods, maybe as well as any other way because of its existential nature. method for working with your piano students? It's really very simple. I try not to interject until they come to the end of a movement at least and sometimes I let them insist rather that they play if it's sonata all four movements or three movements whatever and uh, then I make certain remarks that do not load them down with so much detail that you could not expect them to have it sink in nor have it uh, have a long range effect because it does not sink in. What do you expect your students to uh, become in their professional careers? Where do you expect them to go? I have never been able to really recommend a concertizing career per se for any students because the work is simply not there to be found. This is even true this day and age. Why do you suppose your students come to you? This I couldn't really answer. But you would have to go to my students for that. Well, I can tell you that he teaches much in the manner of Liszt. In this way, instead of uh, de de devoting a lot of time to small details, he paints in a broad stroke. He's a man who can go from the minute detail to the broad prospect, uh, the broad perspective of the piece in two words, and therefore is a vital teacher. Another thing that Gunnar has as an advantage as, as a teacher is a tremendous knowledge of the repertoire. He can play practically everything, and what he can't play, he can sight read. He has 
very few peers in the entire music field who can sight read as well as he can. It is not the sort of lesson where he expects to mold you completely. He wants you to do so much groundwork, so much of your own thought, so much of your own self being put into your music. And one of the most valuable things he has to offer is the respect that he gives a student who has come to grips with certain problems. He never insults your musical intelligence. Your concertizing has often involved anniversaries, centennials, and cycles of performances. That seems to be a great penchant with you. Uh, I think it began with uh, uh, broadcasts on WHA radio. Uh, when did that start? This is correct. It started in 1945 when I gave a series of concerts throughout the year, or rather the season 45-46. Uh, covering the development of the sonata from the earliest sonata up to the present time and in 46-47 uh, I gave the complete piano works of Beethoven in 47-48 the complete piano works of Mozart and uh, in there came also the Schubert works so it might have been that since there's a year missing before I get to shopping, which was 50, uh, 49, 50, when it was shopping centennial. And then came the bicentennial of Bach, which was from 1950 to 53, because the works of Bach are that many that you could not possibly square uh, it in one year with half hour recitals as I was wont to do. As I came to the advent of the big C minor Passacaglia and Fugue. I asked WHA at that time if they had a piece of recording equipment they could let me have so I could go home and try and utilize my two keyboard piano for the performance of this work. And they said yes indeed and I brought back a magna corda and it worked so well that I never went back to the studio. Everything from then on I determined to do on tape at home and then bring it to the studio as we continued the series. So uh, I was encouraged that uh, the interpretational worth as well as the scholarly worth implied in this series should be shared and indeed I found readily uh, libraries throughout the country who were interested in subscribing to the uh, recorded series of the Bach, which, uh, as you know, goes 43 records, something that would not be possible uh, to in, in interest any recording firm. And wherefore, I set up my own recording firm via RCA, custom pressing my recordings. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about some of the instruments in your studio. I'd like to see them. Well, that, that would be a pleasure, and you'll have to proceed. Here we come to the clavichord. Clavichord has an amazingly low tone, that is to say, dynamic voice. As you hear, the instrument was a great favorite for expressive purposes because you could, like on the violin, make a vibrato. And here we have the virginal. The virginal has a tone that by comparison is plain elephantine. And here I owe deep gratitude to Harry and Evelyn Steenbock for this unique, truly unique, there's one in the world, instrument with a double keyboard that functions like this. And with a doubling. What was your next project after you completed the complete keyboard works of Bach? 
That was 1961, and that happened to coincide with the sesquicentennial of Liszt, uh, at which point I began to record the complete Liszt works. In 1961, I happened to go abroad on several errands. I took part in the international piano competition in Munich, and while I was in Munich, uh, I was asked down to an estate in Italy as a guest where I had never been before at the, the Casanova estate. Silvio della Valla di Casanova was a great art lover and collector of Liszt works. His daughter uh, showed me the Liszt collection that her father had amassed and when she heard I had just engaged upon the task uh, of co uh, recording the complete list, she said if my father would have known that he would have wanted to make a present of all this music mm -hmm. to you and this tremendous windfall fell into my arms and this has been in, in, in great substance the part of my source of the list but also the Library of Congress as well as particularly the library, the sta state library in East Berlin that's where I go to uh, find most of the missing list which was actually retrieved by Busoni himself in 77 volumes, if you could imagine. 77 big tomes exist in the East Berlin Library, and of course, it's a tremendous source for any list scholar. Mm -hmm. Would you mind playing us uh, a bit of list right now so that we can really get in the mood? Uh, with pleasure. List. Over on the wall I showed you is the last photograph that was taken of list in the year he died, 86. That year, he also composed the fifth Mephisto Waltz, which he retitled Tonality, uh, Bagatelle Without Tonality, because it's not in a key. It's simply hovers in a tonal cradle without a tonal center. <laughs>
also a composer, and I know you've written several songs, but your magnum opus, if we could call it that, is this fantastic stack of tape over here, which contains how many sonatas? Uh, it begins with 32 and goes now to 354. That's fantastic. Uh, I would have hated to write them down, but they are just trapped on tape. They're on tape? Yeah. They are kind, it's kind, my improvisations are kind of candid music, you know. Mm -hmm. This is how it was that moment. Mm -hmm. But you devise this mentally and then you play it onto a tape so that you don't have to write down the manuscript. Uh, I do very much like Stravinsky uh, suggests in his book when he is asked how he composes. He comes down to the piano and the way his hands happen to fall on the piano is enough to set him off. And uh, Leonardo was quite an improviser. Uh, only an improviser, and he felt that the noble way of musical expression was particularly the spontaneous fashion of improvised music. Well, do you suppose if your hands just fell on the keys right now, you could uh, improvise something for us? I've got to prove the thesis. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to uh, take more time to go on with this, but I would be remiss if I didn't try to mention some of the marvelous accomplishments you've been involved in, which have included the Busoni Piano Concerto in its first American performance in uh, New York City. In New York City. In the, that was a centennial also. Right. And then three years later, a remarkable performance, which was written up in Time magazine and which caused you to be named the man of the year in music, your now famous performance with the Philadelphia Orchestra of the Beethoven uh, transcription of the Violin Concerto, which you were called upon to do on very short notice. Yeah, from one day, one afternoon to the following evening it was. The further exhilarating part of the story came as Ormandy and I met for the first time at four o'clock for the rehearsal. As we walked on to the stage, she said to me, and you have the cadenzas. I said, what cadenzas? I thought I was supposed to improvise the cadenzas. And he handed me 11 pages that I had never seen before of cadenzas that had to be done with the orchestra because the first cadenza is with timpani. Uh, I don't call for a repeat. I understand that one of your own compositions is based on the McCormick Harvester on the Reaper. Yeah, yeah that's a fact, Linda. As a matter of fact, in 1931, it was centennial for the international machinery. Um, little did I know that it was ultimately to lead me to a path of one of the agricultural chief states in the United States. And it was actually via McCormick in some way that I got to Wisconsin. 
and you wrote a toccata called the Song of the Reaper. The Song of the Reaper. Song of the Reaper. And speaking of inventors, another in inventor uh, has had and has a great influence on your life, and that is the great Leonardo da Vinci. It's 1935. I have owned a wonderful piece of land for which I have always felt that some real use should be made of besides making just a real estate venture out of it. And uh, I began to cast about for a possibility of setting up the Academy Leonardo had planned, but as far as we know, he only managed to create a very beautiful emblem for that is famous and known as the knot design. It is one unbroken line which to me symbolizes the interlocking of all things in knowledge and in the universe. And in the recognition of the meaning of this emblem, I could say, did I start in to try to emulate what Leonardo might have had in mind. What I had in mind was to set up something that doesn't come spontaneously at a university. And I proposed interdisciplinary studies. Not like in Princeton, where they get the scholars to come and pursue their individual interests, but rather that we try to get the outstanding minds together and bring to bear their combined candle power in the interest of man's future. So far, it has already uh, come into being in the form of conferences. The last in October took the form of a meeting in the field of fusion energy, and the next one in June will be concentrating on new avenues in cancer research where we will have none less than the most outstanding minds that are exercising themselves in the field of quantum biology, immunology, nutrition, and environmental aspects. And that essentially is what the Leonardo Academy hopes to accomplish, that man begins to interrelate with that degree of interdependence rather than dependence that is due for man if he really wants to make a harmoniously interacting unit out of the world and its people. The preceding program was brought to you in part by a special grant from the Friends of Channel 21 Incorporated.